Welcome back. The first thing we notice about chapter 10 is that for the first time, the subheading concerning what further happened to Don Quixote and the Basque and the danger in which he found himself with a band of Yanguesans does not appear to correspond with what follows. The fight with the Basque is over and the encounter with the Yanguesans, people from the province of Soria, north of Madrid, won't be told until chapter 15. According to Francisco Rico, quote, this surely reflects the changes which Cervantes made at the last minute to his original draft, end quote. Perhaps, but it is still funny, and I suspect that this kind of slip cannot be dismissed as simple. Meanwhile, Sancho Panza obsesses over the government of the island that Don Quixote has promised him. He requests it three times in a single sentence. He has nothing else on his mind. Don Quixote has to clarify that this adventure and others like it are not insular, but rather crossroads adventures in which one wins nothing but a busted head or a missing ear. In chapter 10, Don Quixote's missing ear is mentioned four times. Now, I don't know what to do with this. Sometimes I think Cervantes evokes the ear of Hieronymus Bosch's The Garden of Earthly Delights, a painting stolen from William of Orange by the Duke of Alba in 1568 and then bought by Philip II in 1591. But what if this is a twisted allusion to when St. Peter cut off the ear of the slave Malchus? Cervantes is up to something, and if the ear is a symbol, perhaps it carries a multitude of meanings. And I wonder if the painter Vincent van Gogh ever read Don Quixote. He did something similar to his ear, and for a prostitute, right? Let's continue. Sancho is simple but sometimes very logical. And now he knows very well that the main problem he and Don Quixote have is the law. It would be wise to retreat to a church, for as battered as you left the one with whom you fought, it will not take very much for them to notify the Holy Brotherhood and for them to arrest us. Sancho's shift to informal address expresses his urgency. Don Quixote tells him not to worry and boasts of his victory. Have you read of anyone who displayed greater grit? And we learn for the first time that Sancho does not know how to read nor write. When Sancho observes that you're losing much blood from that ear, Don Quixote brings up the balm of Fierabras. This wondrous beverage, which appears in several medieval works, was associated with the embalming fluid used to preserve the body of Christ. Don Quixote says he has memorized the recipe of this balm, thanks to which one need not fear death. His account of its powers is hilarious. If during a battle, Sancho should see him with his body split in half, he'll simply need to place that part of my body that has fallen to the ground on top of the other half that is left in the saddle, and then you'll give me but two swills of the balm that I have described, and you'll see me sounder than an apple. We can almost hear the gears turning in Sancho's head. His immediate reaction is to devise a get-rich scheme. I renounce henceforth the government of the promised island. All he wants now is for Don Quixote to give him the recipe for the bomb and tell him how much it costs to produce it. When Don Quixote tells him it costs less than three reales to make three azumbres, one and a half gallons, Sancho sees great opportunity, but Don Quixote soon distracts him from his lucrative agenda. While Sancho treats his ear, Don Quixote becomes so furious at the loss of his helmet that he makes a series of vows. First, he swears not to eat bread at the table and not to lie, folgar, with his wife, uh, what wife, until I take complete vengeance on him that hath done me so great a wrong. Sancho reminds him that he has already taken revenge on the Basque, and Don Quixote's response is hilarious. You have spoken well and on point, and thus I nullify the vow. But he recovers his train of thought, saying he will still lead the life he described until he can take by force the helmet of another knight. This establishes the theme of Mambrino's helmet for a future episode. Sancho reminds his master that on none of these roads travel any armed men, but rather only mule and wagon drivers. As he will throughout the novel, Don Quixote observes that Sancho knows little about chivalric adventures. They discuss in similar terms their food provisions. When Sancho says that he has only brought a little onion, cheese, and bread, and has no food appropriate for such a brave knight, 
Don Quixote counters that knights were but men like us, and so when not attending elaborate banquets, they ate like everyone else. Don Quixote has an answer for everything. That night, they reach no town, and thus determined to spend it not at an inn, but near the huts of some goat herders. Thus begins a phase of the novel that can be characterized as pastoral. Having surveyed the cosmopolitan world of Toledo and the entire chaotic history of Hispanic Iberia from its origins in Vizcaya to its modern colonization of the Indies, Cervantes appears to want to start over, tabula rasa as it were, back to nature where humanity lives in its most primitive state. 